Oh, that's right. Um, sorry, um, I, I, uh, I wanted to introduce the next speakers. Um, Carl and Naveen from Pinterest are going to talk about how the Pinterest app is designed and built. So give them a warm up. So I'm Naveen Gavini. This is my colleague, Carl Rice. And uh, we're both mobile engineers at Pinterest. And um, so we gave this talk, uh, Building the Grid on Mobile, uh, a few months ago at our engineering open house, uh, where a bunch of engineers from different disciplines came in. And uh, they thought it was really, really, really useful. Um, it was a really abridged version of it, though. I think it was about 15 minutes. So mm -hmm. we've expanded it out. And uh, we hope you guys enjoy it and take some things away from it. Um, so, so to start it off, um, this is Pinterest, and uh, we've done various different iterations on, on our grid layout, and I think it's the iconic piece of, of really what, what Pinterest is known for in terms, of its, in terms of its design. And I think when people usually talk about Pinterest, they talk about a beautiful, a beautiful visual way to, to look at content. And so, you know, when we started uh, the site, it was primarily on the web, and, and mobile was really just a companion experience. It wasn't, it wasn't the focus of the company. And so on the web, we've done hundreds and hundreds of iterations on the grid. And uh, we've tried everything from flexible width images to having just images to having uh, text, comments, um, attribution. So we've tried a number of different things um, in building different grid systems. So the company really didn't get serious about mobile till about last year, I would say about spring. We kind of set a goal uh, to focus on mobile as a company. And so last summer, the entire company was focused on uh, improving our mobile experience across the board. So we called it the summer of apps. Um, everyone in the company, whether you were a back-end engineer or uh, an operations person, you were focused on improving the experience for mobile users. So. Um, you know, our ops team was, was busy booting up servers. Our infrastructure team was testing latencies around the world. Um, and our mobile team was focused on crafting the best uh, user experience. So, so um, there was a lot of challenges uh, taking those different iterations of, of grid experiments on the web and then translating them to mobile posed a lot of interesting problems. Um, so one of the things uh, that kind of came out of this is uh, at the end of the summer, we, we had this big launch party and we successfully launched all these applications. Um, and now pinners everywhere, no matter what device they own, can actually experience Pinterest. And so um, at the end of the summer, uh, we really took this poll as a company and we said, you know, how long will it be until our users actually adopt mobile apps and on their mobile devices? Because primarily Pinterest was really web driven. Um, and I think like, just the nature of the layout itself, this grid-based layout, um, does really well when you have a lot of screen real estate. And we were kind of questioning whether it would even be uh, like, successful on mobile. And uh, it turns out, so I think we launched our mobile apps uh, August 14th, around there, of last year. And uh, it turns out that actually August 15th, um, mobile traffic at Pinterest was greater than the website. So within a day, um, we had more traffic going to our mobile applications. And today, um, our iPhone app alone is actually our largest platform, much, much bigger than the website. Um, so with that being said, um, whether you're viewing Pinterest on the web, on your iPhone, on your Android uh, tablet or iPad, um, you know, the heart of Pinterest is the grid. And uh, no matter what you're doing, whether you're viewing a feed, a profile, a pin, um, it's all in this grid-based layout. So, um, there's a lot of challenges to building this on mobile, and, and we have a bunch of lessons from it that we'd like to share with you. So I'm going to kick it over to Carl, and he's going to talk a little bit about some of the basic building blocks of, uh, of kind of building a grid, and then also mm -hmm. Android. Uh, cool. So like Naveen mentioned, um, you know, this grid is super important. Um, it's at the heart of basically every view that we have. Um, even some things that you might think are typical grid view uh, are typically our, our own Pinterest grid. Uh, so there are a couple of really important um, sort of 
concepts you want to focus on while you're building your own type of layout like this, especially on Android. I'm going to go into de detail on those. But specifically, uh, cell reuse, so the idea of uh, only showing maybe uh, five or 10 cells instead of thousands of cells if your data set is large. Um, caching, so we cache everything. That's uh, heights, you know, uh, the sort of placements, uh, the views themselves, the bitmaps, um, even the underlying models inside uh, each individual view, such as your matrix or your paint or whatever. Um, uh, one really great area for improvement is re reducing your view hierarchy. Um, so this is true on all platforms, uh, and I'll go into um, some pretty lengthy detail on that for Android in particular. And then one really cool trick that we do um, for all grids, uh, web, Android, iOS, is this primary color. So you can see on the, uh, the image on the left, uh, it's just sort of the, the main color found in the image. Um, and that sort of gives you something to look at that's, that's a much, much nicer than a blank screen before the image loads in. Uh, cool, so Android specifically, um, Adapter View subclass. So Adapter View is the parent of you know, uh, List View, Grid View, uh, and a couple of others that have long since you know, maybe been sunsetted or maybe should be. Um, and we built on top of this because it's just the standard Android pattern. It's a great thing uh, to be able to swap out the underlying uh, presentation uh, while keeping API compatibility. Uh, but we do several things differently. Um, so the, the big thing is actually we pre-calculate our layout. When you're doing a typical uh, list view or grid view, um, as you ask for a cell to be displayed, it actually will pull it up at that point, um, measure it and lay it out and all that sort of thing. Um, but with our sort of non-standard and staggered grid, you can't really do so thing things so linearly. Um, so what we do is pre-calculate -cal in batches up front. Um, and everything's based on rectangles. So you have a viewport, which is sort of your main rectangle. You can offset it by the scroll position. And then, as you can see in this pink outline, um, each cell is also backed by a rectangle. So here's some code. So a lot of you are engineers, and you probably want to know like, how this works. Some feedback that we got um, through our, our open house presentation was that they couldn't think about this unless they saw just a little bit of code. So, at its core, um, we have this method, very simple, place bricks. You pass in sort of a batch. And again, this is mostly for illustration, not necessarily code that you could take and paste, and it'll just work, right? Um, so hopefully this can help just illustrate it. But basically, uh, you're looping through um, just a batch, and you're going to place each brick. Well, I'll show you what that looks like on the next slide. <clears throat> and then when you scroll, you actually want to remove uh, non-visible items, and you want to add the ones that should be visible. And this is just simple rectangle collision detection. Uh, so your main rectangle, again, is your viewport. Um, and then uh, you want to check all your little, one, little rectangles for each item and make sure that they should or shouldn't be on screen. So placing a brick, pretty straightforward, I think. Um, I had a lot more code in here because uh, I tried to actually show you the real stuff, but um, hopefully this gets the point across. Uh, but basically, um, our column widths are standard on uh, the Pinterest grid. They're fixed, so we, we know that's a known. Uh, we can actually pass that in um, to, our, uh, to our view and, and calculate a height based off of that. So we can figure out scaling, we can figure out how big and how uh, sort of big the image is gonna be and how much vertical space the text takes up. Um, and we do something interesting with heights. So we actually, um, as I mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, we cache everything. Uh, heights are one of those items. And we actually get the height from the adapter itself, um, which seems a little crazy. But basically what you do is the adapter knows everything about the view, uh, the view type, and how to get it, and how to use it, and that sort of thing. So what we do is just have sort of a dummy view in there that we measure. We swap out the model, so that way you're not creating tons and tons of views. Um, and eventually we, we measure it to produce this height. And then you can cache it within your uh, adapter view or your adapter itself, uh, whichever you prefer. Um, so then we also made our own brick rect. Um, really, the only thing that we added to it is the column, um, because that's really important. You've got sort of these column layouts. And you can see, like in a lot of our screenshots, there's only two columns. But on tablets, there can be several. Um, so we do that. We, we try to figure out its left uh, position by multiplying the column times the width. Really, really straightforward stuff. Uh, so then we take this, and we stuff it into a data set uh, and, and call it up later. Um, so that's what I mentioned there. Um, so another piece of feedback people uh, gave us, they're like, okay, so you're caching all this stuff, you're making all these recs ahead of time, so how, well, how do you handle change? Uh, so what we do is we actually just uh, notify that particular view that's backed by a given model that something has changed. Um, then we remeasure and recalculate that. Uh, we take the difference of height and then notify all of the, the siblings, as you can see here. So the cell in red, 
uh, it got a tiny bit of text added, um, and that offset the height maybe by, I don't know, 10 dp or something like that. And then we just shift all of the children below it um, by that amount. Um, we opted for performance in this case rather than reflow the entire layout, which could be quite costly. Um, you know, we, we just sort of shift it because it's just a minimal change. If there's a, if there's a big drastic change, we then do force a full flow. So if you delete something or you remove it or maybe you inject someone, uh, maybe in the middle of your data set, you want to definitely recalculate from, again, at that point of, of sort of a dirty data set. So another um, interesting thing that we did, so on the, the left side here, um, we have our original version. I believe it was either 1.0 or maybe like a beta version of the, the Pinterest Android app, which has been out for roughly a year now. So we've had time to sort of iterate and make it better. Um, so this is Hierarchy Viewer, if you're not familiar. Um, but basically, it just shows you the structure and the hierarchy of all your views. Uh, on the left, it's just so big, you can't even, I zoomed all the way out, and on my monitor, I could, still couldn't get all the views. So this is pretty bad. Uh, this is to represent six cells on screen, um, which that's a lot of you know that's a lot of stuff um, for for just six views. Uh, and on the right is what we have today. So it's basically a flat hierarchy: um, six cells, six views. You know, so a one-to-one -one thing. Uh, and the reason why we do this is is pretty straightforward. Um, you get better performance when you know exactly what you're going to do. Um, a lot of the toolkit things, such as text view, image view, those sorts of things, they have a lot of built-in functionality that you may or may not use. They come with a little baggage, a little extra overhead. I'm not saying that they're bad, it's just you know, if you have really complicated views, it's much easier to get performance when you build it yourself and really tailor it and tune it to your exact use case. Um, so you can achieve this in several ways. You've probably seen a lot of this before. Um, compound drawable with intrinsic bounds on a text view will allow you to put icon on left, top, right, or bottom of your text view, and that counts as one. So rather than having an image view and a text view right next to each other, counting as two, and maybe you have a parent, so that's even worse, because now you're nesting it. Um, now you just have this one element that represents multiple visual items at once. Uh, layer list is another cool thing. Um, again, probably pretty common. Uh, there's a, several talks about this uh, in the past, but it allows you to take multiple drawables and put them next to each other, so you can use um, some keywords like left and top and, and et cetera, just to sort of place these things around and allows you to have multiple bitmaps drawn to a single layer. Um, and the next thing is obviously make your own. That's what we talked about uh, in the last slide and what we ultimately ended up doing. Um, one interesting thing that we ended up doing in the beginning was uh, we had you know, a view subclass and then you'd have on draw and you override it and you put a bunch of junk in there. Um, if your view, you know, your view is probably complicated if you're even entertaining this idea. Um, so you end up with like hundreds and hundreds of lines of just like canvas draw and like all these wrecks and things just all over the place. Um, so I'll go into detail on how we actually solve this a little bit cleaner. Um, so again, another piece of feedback was people just like, they're like, okay, great, you're telling us to make custom views, but like, what does that really look like? So here you have a, a snippet of code, again, mostly representative, but uh, pin grid cell, it's sort of the core of our application. It's just about on every screen. I don't know, there may be a few that is not, but um, basically you have a, a view subclass, like I mentioned, um, and it has a bunch of drawables in it. Um, so we made custom drawables for every sort of reasonable bundle of view uh, that you can imagine. So maybe just a nice big image, and that image might have some features to light around it, or maybe put a gradient on it or something like that. Uh, a simple divider. Um, and a description text which maybe handles its own um, sort of ellipsizing or sort of max line count, that sort of thing. Um, and then again, you just sort of use these, combine them all together and fit them into your on draw method. So here's what one of those drawables looks like. Divider drawable. Um, so pretty straightforward. Uh, you're drawing a rect, kind of boring. But that's kind of what, it, you know, that's, it's kind of basic. That's not really what we're here for. You, you, if you wanted to do this, you probably could achieve it with a view and you get pretty decent performance. You're just setting a background on something and setting a height maybe. Um, but basically, we, we have this base drawable, which sort of simplifies a lot of the, the code that you might need to make a drawable, a custom drawable. Um, has things like uh, set height, set width, that sort of thing. Um, drawable does have built-in bounds objects. Um, so. But the, the problem is you need to manipulate that each time. You don't want to like you know, manage your own bounds every time you just want to set a width, right? Um, so basically, this pretty simple class draws this nice tiny little red line down here. So what about something more complicated? Um, so this will represent um, a touchable drawable that actually uh, has an image on the left that is rounded. 
Um, and then two pieces of text. You have a title and a subtitle. Uh, there are a couple of interesting things about this code. Um, I guess the first part is that you can actually press it, um, and then it updates itself. Uh, Drawable has this sort of contract that uh, it allows itself to request it to be drawn again. So you can say, you know, I've been interacted with, uh, maybe here's the touch point, and I should update myself now. And it's sort of this relationship between the view and the drawable. Um, you know, the view tells it when input comes in, and the drawable says, okay, something's changed. Um, so the other interesting part is we added this measure to our base drawable, uh, and this allows us to do several things. Um, most of, you know, most of the time we just call in from our parent um, subclass of view. On measure occurs there, we pass it down to each drawable. The drawable then uh, does a couple of things. It'll set its own uh, sort of dimensions, like where do things belong. Um, you, don't, you definitely don't want to do that in on draw. Uh, people will uh, tell you time and time again that's the biggest mistake you can make with custom drawables or drawing on Android in general is allocating anything and figuring anything out in your draw call. So we do this ahead of time again and cache the result for uh, use later. So that bit of code would draw something like that. So that tiny little cell there with two pieces of text and an icon. Um, previously that might have been maybe three views if you're lucky, um, maybe four if you're kind of lazy or more. Uh, so now we got that boiled down to just one piece of a greater whole, um, which is gonna be much more performant. Um, and then one last thing that we noticed with our performance is uh, you know, caching and images and bitmaps and memory on Android is, is such a huge pain point and it has been for a long time. Uh, especially uh, about a year ago, um, or maybe even longer than that, 18 months ago, when we started building the first Pinterest Android app, there was really nothing there, so we had to build our own cache. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Again, you, you've heard these topics talked about a lot, but basically it's a, uh, a two-stage cache. You have it uh, in memory, and then you have it on disk. Um, and really what the idea here is just to you know, make sure you're doing efficient usage of your, of your uh, sort of memory and uh, sort of ability to display things very quickly. Um, and, and what we found out is that when you build these sorts of things yourself, especially when it's core to your product, images are everywhere on Pinterest. We sort of abuse it. We have you know, beautiful graphics. We've got really big images sometimes. Um, you, know, you just sort of need a lot of custom logic. So we're able to achieve that. Uh, now, I, I've tried several of these other libraries as well, both in the Pinterest app and in you know, sort of my spare time. Uh, you've got great libraries now. You don't have to do this stuff yourself. Um, so you can check these uh, out for sure. Uh, they're definitely you know, worth your time if you, if you just can't invest in a, in a good uh, image library. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna kick it back to Naveen. He's gonna talk uh, in detail about uh, I, the iOS side of things. <clears throat> Cool, so, um, so a lot of the stuff Carl covered uh, kind of also applies to iOS, but I'll kind of go into a little bit of detail on it. Um, so one of the big challenges for us uh, when building for iOS was really um, allowing all of our users to use Pinterest on the go. And, and I think like, it's really important to us to really deliver new features and capabilities on across all platforms. So I think like the topic of a lot of the, today's talks are just like doing mobile at scale. and so. Um, for us, building the grid across all the different OS versions um, and, and really optimizing the feature set to go along with those versions has been pretty challenging. Um, so uh, over the past couple of years, um, you know, these are the different iOS versions that we've uh, kind of gone through and supported, and, uh, and there's been a lot of changes in, uh, in what Apple's given us the ability to use and, and, uh, and with, uh, with native frameworks and also um, with just transitions, uh, animations, and interactions. Um, so really, it breaks down into uh, a few different buckets. Uh, and so I would say about up till a year ago, um, we had our application running, and it supported iOS 4 and higher. Um, and then last summer, we, we made a little bit of a change, and, and we dropped support for iOS 4 and supported iOS 5 and higher. And, um, and then I think about uh, two weeks ago, we launched our uh, 3.0 version of our iOS application, which supports iOS 6 and higher. And so um, with those different versions, uh, you know, the capabilities and uh, support for features really varies. So what it broke down into was two large buckets, uh, iOS 4 and iOS 6 and higher. And, uh, and so to go through some of the differences and walk through um, some of the things that we've learned over the course of time. So, so on the left, you'll see our original iPhone app. So that's like a 
v1.0. And then uh, on the right, you'll see uh, a newer version of it. And uh, there's a lot of differences. And uh, so originally, we built a grid um, for iOS 4. So this was a, a custom-built grid that we kind of did everything ourselves. Uh, I think back then, there was actually Apple didn't really even introduce uh, Collection View, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, so uh, we, we really modeled uh, our grid after Table View. Because um, you know, table view was something that everyone used, that everyone kind of understood the basic mechanics of cell reuse, um, and so that's that's what we modeled our grid view after. So it didn't really have much support for anything. All it did was uh, display images in this uh, three-column uh, flexible height fixed width grid, and uh, all it had really was uh, this notion of cell reuse. Um, I don't even know if it had support for headers and footers and anything other anything else, um, but. Uh, over the course of time, we had to make it better, and, and we added to it. Um, and so on the right, you'll see kind of a, a, a newer version of the app, and you'll see everything has gotten way more complex. So you'll see, uh, you know, there's more, there's much more in the cell. We went from a three-column to a two-column grid, um, uh, and uh, there's attribution. There's there's uh, even icons and and avatars and and descriptions. So everything's a lot more complex. So the grid kind of had to evolve over time with that. So, um, so you know, we we did a lot of work on uh, on building our own grid for for iOS four and five and higher, um, but uh, but at the end of the day, if we were to look at it again, uh, we looked at this library PST Collection View, uh, which is which is a fantastic open source library. So if you're if you guys are building grids uh, on your own apps, I would definitely recommend checking this out um, before you go and kind of write something from scratch if you have to support um, iOS four and higher. Um, so. We made a decision. We were looking at this, and we kind of just decided to kind of go with the, our current grid at the time, um, until very recently, where we've completely rewritten uh, our application. And the reason for that was because in iOS 6, um, Apple introduced UI Collection View, and this really changed uh, a lot of things for for apps that really use grid systems. So for us, um, you know, a lot of things that we were doing ourselves, like you know, uh, headers, footers. Um, cell reuse, everything like that that we were managing ourselves and that we've built into our grid system comes for free in Collection View. So uh, it was a really big change, um, and uh, it's, a fantastic, uh, it's a fantastic framework if you're building uh, a grid for yourself. So, so we just released, like I said, two weeks ago, our 3.0 application, which is iOS 6 and higher, and all the grids on that application are using UI Collection View. So one of the challenges um, that we had when we, were, when we were building it out was that um, the collection view out of the box has a, has a built-in flow layout, which is great for a simple um, fixed width, fixed height grid. But um, we had to build something a little bit more complex because the Pinterest layout is this you know, iconic uh, flexible height fixed width layout. So we built our own masonry layout. And so um, you know, it's, it's very similar to our old grid and, and how, how it worked and how it looked. Um, and so we needed to uh, build a custom layout that supported uh, fixed width flexible height cells, uh, added support for headers, footers using supplementary and decoration views in Collection View. And um, while we were doing this, um, we actually noticed a, uh, something interesting happening. Um, so when we, when we were using UI Collection View and uh, we got uh, pretty far in, in building this thing, um, we noticed that uh, because of the way our layout is, uh, we can have really, really tall cells. So, um, we can have images that are, you know, 5,000 pixels tall that go way off the screen and start on top of the screen. And, uh, and so we noticed this problem when you were scrolling uh, in the grid, the cell would just disappear um, out of nowhere. And we didn't know what it was. We thought it was actually a bug in our code. We spent a lot of time. Um, and it turns out it actually is a bug in UI Collection View in iOS 6. So we ended up, there's a couple different ways that you can kind of go about fixing this. But what was essentially happening was, um, you know, Collection View was trying to reuse that cell um, since it was past the bounds of, of the view. And so, uh, so it was putting it into the reuse pool and therefore like disappearing from the screen. Um, so we, we fixed this by swizzling a category method on, uh, on Collection View for, uh, that swizzles uh, uh, layout attributes for element and rect, uh, and that kind of fixes it. There's a couple different ways to fix it. So if you, if you have a similar layout where you have really tall cells, definitely look out for this in iOS 6. Apple has actually fixed this in, in iOS 7. So the other thing that we're, we're really passionate about at Pinterest is actually 
um, you know, making the experience seamless. And, and so we saw there was a lot of friction in actually the transitions between uh, the grid, tapping on a, on a cell in the grid, and then actually going to a close-up view. So previously, we would do this uh, using a standard UI navigation controller, and that would give you that, um, that transition that essentially looks like a controller is moving and sliding over. Um, and so, so we really wanted to do something different with our latest application, which was uh, provide a really interactive, nice, uh, uh, interaction that, that essentially expands the, the pin. So we were looking at different ways to do this and support iOS 6 and higher. So in iOS 6, um, you know, you can set uh, the collection view layout uh, and, and give it a completion block. And you can specify whether it's animated or not. So this works actually fantastic if you have a fl flow layout. The cells actually go exactly where they're supposed to go. Um, everything looks pretty seamless. Um, but it's a little bit weird when you have a layout like ours. So what, what happens is something like this. The cells kind of go where they think they should go, and you don't really have discrete control over, over where they should go. So you know, it, it doesn't look as bad with, with blue boxes, but when you have actual images that are kind of going uh, above each other and under each other, it just looks pretty bad. Um, so we were a little bit disappointed, and we had to look at other solutions for, for how to build uh, seamless transitions and interactions. Um, so this is where iOS 7 actually helped a lot. And iOS 7 added a lot of new capabilities to Collection View that really make uh, it visually ap appealing and, and, and you able to create really seamless transitions. So Collection View uh, now has uh, a interactive transition uh, to Collection View layout uh, call, which you can actually do really cool things like track the progress of the, the transition. So um, with that, you can immediately think, hey, well, now I can hook it up to a gesture, right? And as I pinch, the cell can expand. Um, so you can do really cool things like that. Um, so that's definitely one avenue that you can explore uh, with iOS 7. The other thing that's really awesome is uh, view controller animated transitions. And this is actually what we use today. Um, so in our latest app, if you're actually to tap on a pin, you'll see it expand somewhat like that. And you're basically inside the grid, and it just zooms into that pin. Uh, and that pin expands, and you get all the detailed information, like the description, comments, and, and other things. So, um, so UI view controller animated transitions is something to look at. And you don't have to use it with collection view. You can use it in uh, other view controllers as well. So across all the different versions that we've done of the grid and, and, uh, and worked on, we've learned a lot about how to optimize grid performance. And, uh, and so you know, at Pinterest, we really try to push this, the design of our, of our application, our grid, to the max. So I think everyone knows, as an engineer, sometimes um, you know, when, you're, when you're trying to build a design, it just, it just impacts the engineering and the performance. And, and you look at things, and you're like, oh, wow, that looks great. But wow, it's going to really scroll terribly, right? So, um, so we spent a lot of time learning uh, how we can optimize things. So, so one of the first things that we had originally in our, in our iOS 4 application was, um, you know, this was back when uh, skeuomorphic design was awesome. Uh, so we had a, we had a texturized background uh, behind our cells, which was like this canvas effect that, that gave the pins this like realistic uh, kind of feeling. And so, uh, so what we noticed was like immediately right off the bat, that was something that was just causing uh, a, a degradation in scroll performance. So um, we worked with our design team, and uh, we changed the, the, the pattern background at that time. But now, actually, with iOS 7, it's a completely flat background. Um, so we gained a lot in scroll performance there. Um, and then there's things that we did around optimizing shadows um, and flattening our view hierarchy. So as Carl showed you earlier, um, you know, on Android, the view hierarchy really matters in performance. And so uh, it, it does as well on, on iOS. So here, um, this is actually uh, this is an app called Reveal. Uh, so I don't know if you guys have ever seen it before, but it basically you can take your, take your application and expand it, the view hierarchy and actually see it three dimensionally. It's really cool. Um, so uh, what we you know what we've done is we've actually tried to flatten out as many of the subviews as possible in our in our cells. So that that makes it draw a lot, a lot quicker when you're scrolling. So um, things like the avatar, things like uh, the description, and the image are all in one uh, flat view, which allows the rendering to be really fast. 
Um, and then the other thing is just height caching. So, uh, so you know, on Pinterest, uh, you can view pins on, on your feeds, on, on profiles, and, uh, and for us, height caching really made a huge difference because um, when you go in and you go out of a pin and you go to a board, um, you, you see the same thing over and over again, uh, the same pins. And so um, being able to cache the heights and also attribute them to the class that they're from allows us to do nifty things like know the height and then change the attribution underneath, but still have a really fast uh, calculation of how, how tall that pin will be. So that helped with scroll performance as well. Um, the next thing that helped grid performance dramatically was actually looking at how we loaded images. And this is something that we continuously are improving and thinking about. Um, and this is, I think, just a problem of, of, of mobile and, and downloading images effectively. So, um, so we use AF Networking. Uh, it's a great open source uh, networking library. And, uh, and so that's what we've, we started using and, uh, a while back. And we've made some improvements since. Um, so when we started using AF Networking, AF Networking has a built-in uh, uh, image view category, and it does uh, built-in memory cache. Um, so uh, we thought that was great, actually. We didn't really see the need for a disk cache at the time. And then um, it's quite funny, like last year we got this, we got a, uh, at and actually contacted us and said, hey, the Pinterest app is actually using a lot of uh, bandwidth and, and traffic on, on our networks, on our cell networks. Is there anything you guys can do? Can we look at it with you to see what's going on? And you know, because we download so many images, it makes a lot of sense. And so, so, um, so we looked at it and we started to notice this trend uh, that, like, you know, there would just be a lot of duplicate images being downloaded. And and we said, well, shouldn't that be handled by the memory cache? And actually, um, by the time, you know. They got to them. The, they were already clear out of memory, so so the memory cache wasn't big enough to hold them, and they'd get evicted. And so we needed a better way to do this. So we looked at a bunch of different disk cache, caching solutions. Uh, we we were in the middle of writing our own, and and we and we tried out SD Web Image, which is another great open source library. And uh, and now we we actually do all our downloading uh, off of SD Web Image, so it's responsible for all the image loading in the app. Uh, we've made some uh, some small improvements to it, and so. Um, around actually how we how we coalesce downloads, and so that was like one of the big things that that we were noticing was that people on edge connections um, were still downloading like four or five or six images at a time, and so um, even though SD Web Image automatically uh, coalesces downloads, we were able to make some improvements to that and actually looking at the users' throughput uh, that they're getting on their device, because as you guys know, um, just because you have three three G service and you have four bars, sometimes for some reason you're downloading uh, at just like 10 KB per second. So, um, so those are some improvements we've made to networking and that helps load images much, much quicker. Um, so I'm gonna toss it back over to Carl and he's gonna talk about some future improvements and current improvements that we're making now. All right, so, um, so what you see here uh, is uh, sort of screenshots of our current iOS app. Um, if you've played with it at all, if you're Pinterest users at all, uh, you can long press these pins, uh, basically in any feed, anywhere it appears, and you get this contextual menu. Uh, so this is coming soon to Android, but the reason why this is important is because this represents one of the first features where it's going to be probably mobile only, but certainly mobile specific in this interaction where we're making uh, great use of just this wonderful device you have in your pocket. You know, we have uh, touch screens and sensors and, and all sorts of things that you just don't have on your desktop. Um, and, and this repre represents a big change for us because in the past we've been following sort of in the, in the shadow of the web, trying to constantly catch up to what they've been doing. But now, um, you know, we're starting to focus on more mobile specific stuff. Um, and the other, other thing that we, we're you know, sort of continually working on, sort of the P0, is just speed and performance. Um, as you add more features, uh, or you change the way things work, or look, or feel, or however, uh, it, you know, it, there's a tendency to sort of lose any optimization you did. Maybe it's like the 11th hour, and you gotta ship something, and you just sort of make these sacrifices. Um, so we're always just focused, you know, laser focused on this, this idea of performance, both in scrolling and you know, the networking, like Naveen had mentioned in the past. Uh, uh, so, and here's, here's some tools to help. So this is what we use. Um, and we, we can send out this list, we can post these slides somewhere, so you don't have to like quickly jot them all down. But, um, 
So there's a couple of just general tools that are great for networking. So this, uh, this tool from AT&T, like Naveen had mentioned, and of course, Wireshark and Charles. And, uh, your, your platform specific stuff is on the, on the right here. And this all helps us to you know, not only inspect our view hierarchy, but also see how long things are taking, you know, what are the most problematic pieces of code as far as uh, time and, and memory uh, cost go, um, as well as overdraw, all kinds of sort of stuff like that. So again, we'll, we'll check this out, um, send it around. Uh, and that is it. Um, I want to sort of thank you for giving us this opportunity to talk. And uh, if you have any questions, we'll take them now. On Android, when you mentioned optimizing the view hierarchy, do you have any measurable statistics on how much that sped things up? Yes. So for us, it was um, it was about three and a half x. So you know, it, again, you're dealing with milliseconds, so you're thinking like, okay, maybe it takes 16 milliseconds to draw, that's not a big deal, but if you can get down four milliseconds, and you're doing like hundreds of cells per minute, maybe even 30 seconds, you know, that's, that's huge, that adds up over time, that's more time that you can get to do other things, whether it be render more cells, or do tasks in the background, or just, you know, be a good citizen, right? Use less CPU, less battery, that sort of thing. Uh, uh how do you deal with the memory management on really low memory Android phones uh, while downloading a lot of images? Yeah. Um, so our, our cache, I, I mentioned it's two-stage, like just about any other cache, where you uh, we, we bring it into memory first um, and then save it out to disk. Um, it gets purged every now and again. Uh, we have an LRU map that's based on memory, so it can never get depending on the device, we have some sort of like weird function that determines like, is this a crappy device or not? It's like an is crappy device method. Um, and that determines how much of your heap gets allocated towards bitmaps, um, anywhere from, I don't know, I would say like seven to 15% uh, of your heap at any time is reserved exclusively for bitmaps. We still have out of memory, it happens, it's extremely difficult to avoid, but we've been able to mitigate uh, most of those just by you know, using this method of not just 100 bitmaps, it's maybe, 100 kilobytes of bitmaps. From flattening the, the view hierarchy in a cell for iOS, um, there was a blog post uh, a month or two ago regarding the performance of a, a UI table view cell um, being flattened or being, uh, I guess, with a few full hierarchy. And um, it seems like to confute the fact that now flattening the view hierarchy would be convenient implying that the Windows Server in the background is actually faster to compose the layers than the straight uh, CG core, core graphics uh, drawing. Uh, have you seen any of that in? Uh... Yes, so I think the biggest improvement for us has really been, um, and it's funny because these things change with, with the iOS design, but um, you know, iOS 6, when, when there was a lot of shadows involved, um, when we did the, when we offloaded the shadow drawing to the background and actually constructed the view in the background with the, with the actual shadows, like that's when we actually saw the big improvement in performance, really. So the shadows was the... Yeah. Do you have a way to calculate the height of the pins without actually doing the CG calls? Uh, no, uh, we do not. We have to actually compute. Um, we have like the image height, but then we have to actually compute the height for uh, the text, right? Yeah, for the text. Um, uh, for Android, uh, for the images that you downloaded, do you measure the width and height inside the app? So, mm -hmm. like, you know, instantiate a bitmap, or do you actually get that from the uh, the API? Yeah, so our API actually tells us how big the image is going to be before it gets to us. Sometimes it's wrong, or maybe it's off by a pixel or something like that. It's sort of, you know, when you're pulling images from all these sources and processing them and doing all sorts of things like that, you just have to be resilient to potentially having a 10,000 pixel image like I had mentioned before. And if you've ever tried to show that in a hardware accelerated environment on Android, it's pretty difficult. Um, so yeah, we definitely get it. And then we do some scaling too, because every device is different, right? You've got all these different DPIs and uh, physical screen sizes and things like that. So you might have to scale it up or down. Uh, it's pretty rare that the image that comes in is the exact right size. Uh, hello there. Um, now Android, are you actually, um, did you overwrite the uh, grid view or you actually like overwrote the uh, staggered List view, or did you write your own? So we, so we wrote our own. We took the base class that GridView and ListView are built off of, 
um, and we just implemented our own layout for that. Um, and the reason why is because it actually follows the pattern very well. Um, and we couldn't actually make list or grid view work to fit our uneven nature. Um, I've explored the stagger grid view a bit. It has some weird bugs here and there. It's getting better with community contributions, but it still doesn't follow the patterns very well. It doesn't have support for empty views and things like that. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm hoping one day that Google gives us something like UI collection view. That's you know makes layout really awesome and easy. So, um, so how do you calculate uh, image high and the server? Do you do that when people that, you know just upload image, or do you do it in batch? Yeah. Um, so. We generally calculate it on pin creation. So yeah, when, when somebody uploads an image, um, we, do, uh, we do a couple of operations. We do uh, image height calculation. We also do a bunch of dynamic resizing to kind of resize that image to actually um, fit our different screen sizes. So uh, on iOS, for example, we'll, we'll serve out a retina and non-retina image of that, of that same size. And then for Android, there are a bunch of different sizes as well. And then for the web, there's different sizes as well. So, um, so yeah, we, it goes through a bunch of image resizing. And then uh, the images are resized to fit the grid. So um, it's a pretty standard, standard size that we use across, uh, across grids. And, then, um, and so that's pretty much there. And then we just have like a height calculation, essentially. Uh, sure, so I, I can repeat the question. It, um, he was asking about uh, animation on Android, if we use a library or anything like that. Um, yes, yeah, so we do, uh, so for Pinterest, we support API 10 and above. Um, so that means basically one version of Android that we have to support that does not fun animation. So we use nine old Androids. Um, has some weird issues and bugs here and there, but generally for typical, just sort of like move things here and fade it out or, or whatever, it's, it does really well. Uh, other than that, I would just use Object Animator. That's, that's what fits our needs. Yeah. So for iOS, uh, for the scaling, you use the standard iOS thing, or you have your own scaling mechanism as well? Um, for, for which, which for scaling? For photo, uh, for, for the photo? pictures, yeah. Oh, for, for the scaling is actually all done server side. So we, we're actually resizing all the images um, when they're created, whether they're created on the web or uh, via any of the mobile devices. They're all. Uh, the, pin, the image will actually go in, and then we'll, we'll dynamically resize it on, on, our, on our back end. So you mentioned some of the, some of the tools you use to um, see what, uh, what works well uh, for performance-wise, memory analyzer, stuff like that. How do you actually make sure that those tools get used, and who's responsible for uh, seeing what performance is doing? Interesting question. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, Sonny, he's here somewhere in the crowd. Uh, he is our Android performance nut, and he he loves to make sure things are really fast and memory efficient, and and also great code at the same time. So he generally is you know always on top of it. Typically, when I'm writing a piece of code and something just is not working right, it, you know even even on like a you know maybe an S4 or something like that, it should be like blazing fast, right? Um, so it must be terrible on, on something like a uh, like an S or something, an Nexus S. But basically, that's when we hop in, like if something is just going terribly wrong. Uh, but we do smoke tests. We, you know, we have um, people testing the app all the time, and they'll just say, like, hey, this is terrible. Please fix it. <laughs> um, that's what we do on the Android side, at least. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's really similar on the iOS side. And then I, I think we just practice a really good internal culture of yeah. testing. Um, and so. Uh, so yeah, uh, people try to use it in as many places as possible. Um, and then I think um, you know there are times where we just put a focus on it. So uh, I think we, we go through a period where we build stuff, and then um, and then like probably the next release we actually focus on honing in on performance and stability. Um, so. Um, so I've used the Pinterest iOS app, and I want to talk a little bit about the interaction you guys. I think. I think you guys invented the whole idea of the long press and you have the radial menu come out. I haven't seen that anywhere else the way you guys have pulled it off. I think it's actually really, really nice. I want to see more uh, mobile apps kind of just start using it because I think it's a really, really nice just uh, interaction model if we can train a lot of people to do that kind of thing. Are you guys trying to open source that in any way? Are you trying to push that out or is it just kind of like a silent, like sexy Pinterest feature that you guys just want to hold on to for now? 
Um, yeah, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, so Stephen here, uh, uh, one of our engineers, he, he actually built that in collaboration with the designer, and and I, I agree. I think it's awesome. Um, and uh, you know, I think you know one of the interesting things to your point, um, and I think everyone here uh, can kind of do this with us, is that you know the mobile devices are really touch-based devices, and so you know what we noticed is when we first built Pinterest um, a couple years ago on mobile was that. You know, everything we were doing, when you went to go repin something, you hit a button, then you filled in a form, and then you hit another button that did a drop down, and then you hit another button to actually pin it, where why shouldn't it just be like something simple like dragging your finger into, some, into, into a board or, or actually just like swiping or long pressing? And so, you know, we've constantly been trying to actually push users in into this, uh, into this gestural uh, interface, and uh, we try to do it, uh, we try to be really thoughtful while we do it, and so, um, so, uh, that specific um, case of that menu, I think, was our first uh, foray into that. And, uh, and so we, we constantly try to do that. And I, I don't know if we will uh, actually open source it. That's actually a really good question. Um, but uh, I think we will probably start open sourcing more stuff that we do uh, in general. Um, but um, one of the things to take away from that, just to, uh, just to talk about it a little bit, that specific menu, which is because I think it's a really interesting use, uh, case study. Is like, you know, we, we did that uh, contextual, we call it the contextual menu internally, where you basically long press on an object on a pin in the grid, and these bunch of uh, options fly out, which you can easily quickly take an action. And uh, we actually put a button in the grid um, that was like a pin it button. And on each and every cell, there was, there was a pin it button. And we tried it with different colors. We tried it with different shapes, making it large and small. And then we also added a trade-off where you can either press the button or you can either long press on that pin to, to take the same action of, of pinning it. And it actually turned out, surprisingly, more people would long press on the pin than actually hit the button that was right in front of their face. So like to us, when we did that, we basically gut checked ourselves and said, OK, you know, gestural interfaces really do work, um, and we want to do as much as we can to optimize those things. So, so we're going to invest more and more into, into building interfaces like that, and, and we hope that, you know, the rest of you developers actually uh, do the same in your applications. And that way, users as a whole on mobile will be uh, more trained to use them. All right, so I think we're done. Thank you very much, Carl and Naveen.